All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, we're really excited to have uh, Professor Dan Bonet here uh, from uh, Stanford. Uh, Dan is one of the pioneering uh, contributors in the area of cryptography uh, and security. And uh, he is the inventor of uh, identity-based encryption, uh, at least the, the way that it's been constructed. Uh, amazing. He's a popularizer and uh, uh, major contributor on the, in the world of bilinear maps, which has also transformed cryptography. Uh, he's the winner of many prizes, including the ACM Prize in Computing, uh, which is sort of the, the precursor to the, to the Turing Award, um, which we expect you'll get soon enough. Um, and uh, we're really pleased to have him here, and he will be telling us about cryptography for cryptocurrencies. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Amit. This is, that's a, a wonderful introduction. It's a, it's a real honor to be here, and it's a real pleasure. I'm actually uh, super impressed with the new building, so congratulations. Enjoy it. It's a beautiful auditorium, uh, so uh, I'm really, really, really happy to be here, and thanks for, uh, thanks for inviting me. So what I wanted to do today is tell you a little bit about um, this new area, actually, that's emerging that's related to cryptocurrencies, and in particular, I'll talk about applications of cryptography to cryptocurrencies. So I'm sure you've all heard about cryptocurrencies, but just in case you haven't, uh, I wanted to quickly uh, put up this, uh, this, uh, this, this graph up. Uh, so these are just the five most popular, or rather the largest cryptocurrencies on the market today, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple, and Litecoin. Bitcoin Cash, I guess, is a derivative of Bitcoin. Uh, and their market caps. Yeah, so these things have actually, uh, this is like the first time a cryptocurrency is literally taking off in a big way. You can see the market caps are phenomenal here. Bitcoin, uh, I guess I looked at this is uh, from uh, yesterday or maybe two days ago. Bitcoin is now at $188 billion. It's an amazing uh, um, amount for a cryptocurrency. Uh, you can see that the, I listed the change. Oh, here, let me just turn on my uh, laser pointing here. Just one second. So I listed the uh, changes per, uh, in the last 12 months. These are not measured in percentages. These are factors of order. These are factors of multiples that these things have gone up by. So Bitcoin has gone up by a factor of 10. Uh, Ripple has gone up by a factor of close to 200. Just so you realize, if you had spent, if you had bought $1,000 worth of Ripple a year ago, today you would have $100,000. Yes, uh, sorry, $200,000. Yeah, what's $100,000 between friends? Um, right, so it's got, they're gone up by amazing factors, and that's actually generating a lot of interest uh, in the area. But um, the question is, where, where is this all going? Right, so these are amazing uh, uh, valuations that, that we're seeing generating a lot of uh, interest for invest from investors uh, and so on. But where is all this going? So the question is, you know, first question is like, what are these things actually used for? And one of the main applications today is essentially kind of things like Bitcoin are being used as a replacement for gold. Yeah. So as you know, gold by itself, you know, maybe is not such a useful thing. And yet we use it as a reserve, uh, reserve uh, asset in case of fluctuations in the market. The problem with gold it's kind of hard to maintain. Yeah, it's, you got to have you got to have armed uh, guards in front of your in front of your room where you have your gold. It's a little hard to carry across borders. Uh, whereas cryptocurrencies are 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 not that difficult to secure, uh, although it does take some care. They're very easy to carry around. You can easily move across borders uh, with cryptocurrencies, and as a result, it's it's actually being uh, used as part of a replacement for gold. It's quite interesting if you if you buy into that argument, that says that. Um, Bitcoin, which is worth $200 billion today, could in principle go up to the level of what gold is worth in the world, and there's $40 trillion worth of gold in the world. So Bitcoin could actually, in theory, again, if you buy into this uh, argument, could actually qu have quite a ways to go um, in terms of valuation. Uh, it could also be a vehicle for international transactions, right? So here's an example where um, cryptocurrencies outshine traditional currencies. So like this is a classic example I like to give. So imagine parents in Germany want to hire a math tutor for their child, and the math tutor happens to be in Russia. Okay? So they can tutor over Skype. That would work perfectly well up until the point where it comes to payments. So now the parents, after every lesson, they have to pay the tutor, say, $10 worth of, of funds. How do you do that? How do you transfer $10 from, uh, from Germany to Russia? You know, the current, the current uh, financial market is simply not set up for this. Whereas cryptocurrencies make it trivial, right? You can literally buy $10 worth of Bitcoin or $10 worth of Ethereum, transfer it to Russia, and now the tutor gets paid uh, with very few transaction fees uh, in the middle. So again, these are like nice applications, 
that the current financial system just simply does not support. And of course, there's another theory which says this is all a bubble, it could all crash, and who knows? It all go to zero, we don't really know how where this is gonna go. I claim that these are actually, for us, these are completely the wrong questions to ask. This is what the public is interested in, right? This is kind of what you hear, read about in the press, uh, and uh, what's driving all the, uh, the, the, the um, commercial interest in these, in these technologies. The question to us, though, is completely different. As academics, the question to us is, is this actually a new science here? Does this area raise new, new scientific questions to think about? And my answer to you here is absolutely yes. This area suffers from way, way, way overhype. But if you strip away the hype, there really is a new scientific discipline being created here. And it's a scientific discipline that, cross, that cuts across almost all of computer science and even beyond computer science. Yeah, so just to give you a few examples. Uh, in distributed systems, this area of uh, cryptocurrencies, as we'll see in a minute, introduces new uh, ideas into what are called consensus protocols. Yeah, in fact, the original uh, Bitcoin paper by Satoshi Nakamoto in 2009 had a brilliant idea for a new consensus mechanism. Yeah, as we'll see, as we'll see in, just, in just a minute. And there, it raises whole new questions about consensus protocols that have not been asked before. Uh, when you talk about things like smart contracts, these are programs that are actually run on the blockchain, uh, there's a need for a whole new generation of programming languages for these smart contracts. In particular, the realization over the last couple of years is that we don't want Turing complete languages. We want languages that are not Turing complete so that they're very easy to un analyze and understand how long they take to run. And so there's a whole need for a new generation of programming languages uh, for these smart contracts. Verification tools. Um, if you make mistakes in your code here, you end up losing a lot of money. There's a wonderful example um, of a bug in a wallet that because of this bug, uh, um, huge amounts of money, millions of dollars essentially got deadlocked in a way that they can never be, that's very difficult to retrieve them. So you'd like to verify that you know, your contracts are not gonna get stuck. The money from your contracts is not gonna get stolen as in what happened in the, in the DAO event and so on. So there's a desperate need for new verification tools. Of course, there's a need for new cryptography which is what I'm gonna talk about. And there's also wonderful new questions in algorithmic game theory. Um, for example, when you, use, when you look at mining pools, if you, if you know what mining pools are, uh, this would mean something to you. The question is how do you distribute funds in a mining pool? That's a, mechanism, a, new, mechanism, mechanism, that's a new mechanism design question that has not been asked so far. And again, wonderful area for research. So you see this cuts across all of computer science. And of course, um, there are interesting questions here for econ economists, for lawyers, for business in the business school. Uh, so really there's a new, new um, scientific discipline that's being created here. And I have to tell you, the sad news is that academia is falling behind here. Most of the work in cryptocurrencies, most of the innovation today is actually coming from the world of startups and, and commerce. Uh, and it's actually high time for academics to get much more involved. There are already a number of research groups, including ours, who are actually uh, very active in the space, but not enough. In particular, uh, maybe, I hope I'm wrong, but I don't know of anyone in UCLA who's working in this area. So I would strongly encourage uh, you, know, uh, you, the department, um, uh, as individually, you know, look at this area. Uh, there's a lot of papers out there that lots of resources to get started and learn about the area. I would personally encourage you to do that. Um, I actually, I realize I should have put some references. Maybe if you're interested in learning more, just send me mail and I'll send you a reference to a whole bunch of papers uh, to read that are a good way to, uh, to introduce yourself to this area. So personally, I think this is worthwhile getting into, and as a, as a department, uh, you definitely wanna hire folks who work, uh, who work in the area. So yeah, this area, this is not, um, uh, you know, this is not a momentary, uh, this is not a fad. This area is actually is here to stay with us. I bet you that in 20, 50 years, this will still be, this will still be a, a fairly active area of, of research. Today, what I wanna tell you about, of course, is my area, which is, which is kind of applied cryptography. And so I want to tell you about applications of cryptography to blockchains and cryptocurrencies. So that's the plan for today. So, so far, for, so much for the 10,000 feet foot view, now let's get down to business. So I guess before I tell you about new cryptography for blockchains, I have to tell you a little bit about how blockchains work, just so that we are all on the same page. Um, so if you, haven't seen, uh, if you haven't seen much of blockchains before, uh, let me just explain what the blockchain is, uh, again, at a very, very high level, if you're interested in learning more about kind of the formal properties that a blockchain provides, there's this really nice paper by Rafael Paz, Seaman, and Abhi Shalat from 2016 that actually formalizes what uh, the blockchain 
uh, provides, uh, I highly recommend reading this paper. Um, so what is a blockchain? Again, very, very, very informally and at a high level, basically it's something that's provi that provides three properties. The first property is that anyone can write to the blockchain. Yeah, so anyone can write whatever they want to the blockchain. Of course, there's some verification that takes place. If you write something invalid, it will be ignored. Uh, but in principle, anyone can write to the blockchain. And the point is there's a liveness property that ensures that no one can prevent you from writing to the blockchain. Okay? So if someone specifically wants to target Amit and say, Amit, you're not allowed to write to the blockchain, that is simply not possible in the blockchain architecture. Okay? So there's a liveness property. There's a persistence property which says that once data is written to, to the blockchain, it can never be removed from the blockchain. Now I have to caveat that with a star in that that's, that can not be achieved unconditionally. It can only be achieved under certain assumptions. And the assumption that most blockchains make is uh, that the adversary has limited computing power. In particular, you must have heard the adversary cannot take more than 51% um, a a of uh, the, the uh, computing power on the chain, or more accurately, cannot take more than a third of the computing power in the blockchain. So that's the persistence property. So, so far, so good. Anyone can write. Once something is written to, it always stays on the blockchain. And the last property is a consensus property, which basically everybody agrees on the current state of the blockchain. So there's no debate on uh, whether the blockchain is this or that. Um, and of course, everybody, everyone can read what the current state is. Once you have a mechanism like this, it makes a lot of problems quite easy. Yeah, question. Yeah, technically, actually, you're absolutely right. The star actually belongs on consensus as well. Yeah. And in, in fact, uh, again, when you look at the formalisms, I wanted to kind of make these three points, but consensus actually follows from the first two properties. Yeah, it's, it's embedded in them. Um, so, but you're absolutely right. The star belongs on the, on the consensus property as well. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good comment. Um, okay, so once you have uh, these, these properties, once you have a blockchain that supports it, it enables lots and lots of applications. One of the first applications that happens to come up is currency. Right? You, clearly, if you have a mechanism like this, you can implement an accounts-based system where you know, I have a certain amount of money in my, certain amount of Bitcoin, say, in my account, and if I want to pay Rafi, um, basically I write to the blockchain the fact that I paid Rafi. Once that's written to the blockchain, it can never be removed, so I can never get my money back. Right? The transaction happens, it can never be reversed, and that's how you can build a currency out of, out of a blockchain. But you can do lots of other things with a blockchain. For example, um, if you buy a car, you can put the fact that you own that car, the VIN for the car, you can put it on the blockchain. And because it can never be removed, no one can then claim that this car does not belong to you until you sell it to somebody else. And that will also go on the blockchain. Uh, you know, we've been talking to the Stanford Registrar, for example, about putting Stanford transcripts on the blockchain. So even if Stanford disappears for some reason, you know, your transcript will always, always, always stay on the blockchain. And you can always prove that um, the version of the transcript you have is the latest version of the transcript. So you can imagine uh, all sorts of uh, things that are uh, possible on the blockchain. Of course, maybe you've heard of uh, CryptoKitties, which is yet another application. No, you haven't heard of CryptoKitties? Who's heard of CryptoKitties? Of oh, course, good, thank you, thank you, yes. So CryptoKitties is a game basically to illustrate um, brilliant, brilliant game. Go look it up, CryptoKitties, yeah. A uh, brilliant game to illustrate uh, how blockchains work. And there, that's basically a game where you buy, you buy cats and then the cats do all sorts of things. You know, people love cats, right? So you buy cats and then uh, you can sell your cat and you can buy other cats and the cats are really cute. I think I showed CryptoKitties to my daughter and she immediately wanted to go, me to go spend money to buy a cat for her. So it's very addictive. And believe it or not, some of these cats are sold, like you laugh, but some of these cats are sold for $100,000, yeah? So people pay serious money for cute cats. Um, Okay, good. So, so that's a good, uh, good, uh, good, good, good application. Yeah. So then there are now many other games that are played on the blockchain as well. So that's another application for the blockchain. You own the cat, the really cute cat. You own it, and no one can take it away from you until you sell it. Yeah. So that's kind of the power of the blockchain. All right. As what? The cat never dies. No. Not only does it not die, it's actually it's look this game Crypto Kitties. You should really look it up because it's a brilliant, brilliant game. Not only does it not die, it can actually uh, have, have kittens, and then you can sell the kittens. So if you own a popular cat, it'll produce popular kittens, which you can sell, and then, uh, you know, have fun doing that. Yeah, so it's a very, very clever game. And it's all run on the blockchain, yeah. And um, uh, again, that guarantees that you own the cat, and no one can take it away from you. Okay, so I guess I wanted to start, talk a little bit about how Bitcoin works specifically, but everything I say in the talk today will apply generically to all blockchains, or most blockchains. 
Uh, okay, so in the Bitcoin blockchain, just so that you understand what we're talking about, uh, essentially, well, it's a block chain. Yeah, so it's a chain of blocks. So here you can see uh, the different blocks one, one after the other. Essentially, every block uh, contains a number of transactions. Typically, it's, a, it's around, uh, you know, a thousand, maybe two thousand, sometimes a few more. But it's a couple of thousand transactions that are contained in a block. These transactions are, um, are basically hashed using what's called a Merkle tree. So it's a tree of hashes. H here is a hash function. Uh, it's a tree of hashes, and the root of the hash tree uh, is embedded in the actual block header. Yeah, so this is the, the, where the block header is stored. Now, in the block header, there's a timestamp, which I won't talk about. There's a nonce, which I guess I won't talk about either, because I'm actually not going to talk about consensus mechanisms today. I'm only going to talk about crypto. The nonce and the timestamp are used for consensus. Um, and then uh, the, every block contains a hash, and this hash is basically a hash of the previous block. So if you think about it, this hash basically is a hash of all the blocks that essentially came in front of it, before it, uh, although we're just hashing the previous block header because the previous block header contains the hash of the block before it, and so on and so forth, this hash really kind of represents a hash of the entire blockchain. So every uh, block contains a hash of everything that came before it. Now, why do we have a Merkle tree? Uh, the point is, if I wanted to prove to you that I paid you, right? So say I pay Rafi one Bitcoin, and I want to prove to Rafi that I actually paid him. All I have to do is show the uh, current block header. Rafi will have to check that this block header really is in the blockchain. And then I just show the Merkle proof. I give you the, you know, the path to the root to, to, to prove to you that, in fact, the transaction that says pay Rafi $1 is included in that, in that, uh, in that block. Yeah, that's how Rafi is convinced that, in fact, $1 uh, was transferred. So that's the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, now, uh, it's interesting that actually in Bitcoin uh, and in other blockchains as well, actually funds are not represented using accounts. Yeah, it's not that there's an account that corresponds to Rafi that says Rafi owns such and such Bitcoins. In fact, the model is quite different and it turns out to be a really nice design that's, uh, that's implemented here. It's what's called the UTXO model. So UTXO stands for unspent transaction outputs, unspent transaction outputs. And the way, it, the way funds are represented uh, in this UTXO model is the following. So we have these transactions. Remember, transactions are embedded in blocks, uh, but transactions are kind of the fundamental unit that transfers amounts from one side to another, from one address to another. And then every transaction basically has a bunch of inputs. Okay, so these are, uh, these are funds going into the transaction. So these are amounts going into the transaction. And then there are a bunch of outputs. So if you look at a particular output, um, there's an address that the output corresponds to. So which, which address receives uh, this, um, uh, this fund and then the amount of money that actually, the amount of block of Bitcoin that's actually now uh, bound to this address. What is the address? The address is basically, again, address can be many different things in its simplest form in what's called uh, pay to public key hash. Uh, the address is simply a hash of your public key. All right, a hash of your public key in its simplest form. Uh, okay, good. So now all of a sudden, your address, which is the hash of your public key, is now has this amount of money associated with it. And, you know, there could be more, more than one output. So, for example, um, I might pay one person, my, a transaction might pay one person and also pay another person. It's very common, for example, that a transaction has a number of inputs. Say, I own a bunch of um, addresses. I use those addresses to fund the transaction. And then uh, I pay a merchant with the amount of a certain amount of value. And then the second output is the change that I would get back from the tra transaction. Yeah, so I might pay a certain amount, and whatever is left over is routed back to another one of my addresses. So that's what a transaction uh, looks like. And so I just have to explain to you what are the inputs to the transaction. And so an input to a transaction is basically an output of a previous transaction that has not yet been spent. Okay, so there are no accounts. Funds are represented as outputs of transactions that have not yet been spent. Okay, so here, transaction input essentially corresponds to a pointer into a previous transaction output, and then my signature uh, authorizing this payment. The signature is relative to the public key embedded in this address. Okay, so this once I sign, essentially this says I authorize to spend this transaction output and fund this new transaction. So once I spend this transaction output, this transaction output basically can no longer be spent. Every transaction output can only be spent once. Okay, so when you look on the blockchain, essentially funds are only represented 
in terms of unspent transaction outputs, and that's the only thing that needs to be kept in, mem in memory uh, to validate that transfers are done correctly. Yeah, so that's basically how money is represented. What I want you to, to remember for the rest of the talk is basically there are inputs to the transaction, there are outputs to the transactions. The inputs contain signatures saying that I authorize for the funds to be spent, um, and the outputs contain both the targets of the transaction and the amount of money being transferred to that address. Okay? That's, again, a very simplified model of the blockchain, but for our talk today, that will be sufficient. The blockchain can actually do a lot more than that. You can actually have more complicated <coughs> programs run, but for our talk today, this will be, this will be sufficient. So far, so good? Everybody with me? Okay, excellent. All right. Um, very good. So let's continue. So one thing that's interesting is uh, the signature that was designed in, that was used in Bitcoin is what's called an ECDSA signature. Yeah, ECDSA signatures. Now, those are standardized signatures, are standardized uh, by NIST. Uh, but I have to say that as a signature scheme, ECDSA signatures are not the greatest cryptographic signatures in the world. Yeah, we have better signatures that the crypto community has come up with. Um, it would have been great, actually, if Bitcoin had adopted one of the more sophisticated signature schemes. And let me give you one example why that's true. So suppose you look at one block on the blockchain. If you think about it, really, uh, essentially, you know, here you have one, it, here's one transaction with its inputs and signatures and the output. Here's another transaction. This transaction has three inputs and two outputs, and there, therefore there have to be three signatures, one signature for each input. Here's another transaction with one input and three outputs and so on and so forth. Okay, so you can see this is like one block on the blockchain. The interesting thing is that um, these signatures actually take up a huge amount of space in the block. Yeah, in the entire block. Um, so in fact, uh, a big chunk of the space allocated to the block is taken up uh, by, these, um, by these signatures. And because blocks have bounded depth, bounded length, yeah, so blocks can be one megabyte or two megabyte depending on which version uh, you're in, uh, blocks can have bounded length. That means that because these signatures are large, that reduces the number of transactions you can have in a given block. Now, in principle, there's a, a huge benefit to having blocks with many transactions because every transaction has a corresponding transaction fee to it. Yes? So if you create a block with a bunch of transactions, you get to collect all the mining fees associated with those, um, with those, with those, with those transactions. So the more transactions you can put into your block, the more mining fees you get to collect. So the fact that these signatures all have to be, yeah. Oh my God, okay, that's, that's because of uh, consensus reasons. The longer the blocks are, the longer it takes to propagate them. And propagation delay is the enemy of consensus. Yeah, so there's a hard limit on, uh, on how many. That's one of the reasons, yeah, one of the main reasons, yeah. Um, yeah, so great, but why is, there, why is there a limit on the block size? And it's because, exactly, because uh, you want to limit propagation delays, you want to limit the impact of forks, and, and so on. So there's a lot of issues with um, uh, achieving consensus that forces this, 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 uh, this, this uh, limit. Um, by the way, this, you know, one of the, this was a huge, huge debate inside of the Bitcoin community, like what should the, the block size limit be? Uh, the larger the blocks are, the faster you can process transactions. Uh, but the larger the block size, the harder it is uh, to achieve consensus and so on. Uh, okay, so, um, uh, so again, the, pro the fact is that all these signatures are written explicitly in the block means that we can, it shrinks the number of transactions we can include in one block, which goes counter to the, um, to, 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 to the uh, uh, miners' uh, incentives. And so the question is, is there a way to do better? Could we somehow maybe aggregate these signatures together? And it turns out the answer is yes. We have signature schemes that allow us to take a bunch of signatures and compress them into a single signature. Okay, so in fact, this is not possible with ECDSA. This is why I say it's kind of, it's kind of an unfortunate choice that these cryptocurrencies chose ECDSA as the signature scheme. Uh, if they had chosen a different signature scheme, in particular, um, in particular, if they had chosen a signature scheme, which I happen to like, called BLS signatures, and you can, I won't say why I like it, but um, it's a, <laughs> Uh, well, okay, but developed by us. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a signature scheme that actually supports aggregation. And what it would allow you to do is essentially take a lot of these signatures that are in the block and essentially compress them into just a very short signature that authorizes all these transactions at once. Yeah, so 
essentially the cost of all these signatures together could have been could have been avoided if a different signature scheme had been used. So in fact, new blockchains that are actually being designed now actually are using uh, are using uh, um, you know these these better uh, these better signature schemes. So it's kind of interesting that technology is adapting, uh, and I have to say it's 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 uh, really quite great, quite wonderful to see kind of modern crypto technology being used uh, in, these, in these real blockchains that are then used to protect real money. Okay, so that's uh, the issue of signatures. All right, now let's talk about kind of the fundamental problem with, with many of the existing blockchain mechanisms. So I claim that the way Bitcoin is designed fundamentally is, uh, does not support, is, cannot be used by businesses. Yeah, there's a fundamental mismatch between uh, how Bitcoin was, Bitcoin was built and what businesses actually need, uh, which is preventing its use for business applications. And let, let me explain what I mean by that. So what I wrote here is an example of a Bitcoin transaction. And what you can see, maybe it, the font is a little small, so you probably can't read all of it, but it doesn't really matter. The details don't really matter that much. Um, let me just say that what's written in the transaction are over here are the inputs. Okay, you can see an input address, a UTXO, another UTXO, this is the value of the UTXO and the, the input UTXO and the value of the second input UTXO. And what you have on this side is, again, the output address, how much money is being sent to this output address, uh, another output address, and how much money is sent to the other output address. Here, by the way, is a transaction fee. So the transaction also uh, includes a fee, and whoever mines this transaction gets to collect this fee. Okay, good. So uh, one problem, of course, is addresses are completely in the clear. So you can tell exactly who's paying who in, uh, in Bitcoin. And the bigger problem is that actually the amounts that are being transferred are completely in the public. Anyone can see for every transaction how much money was tra transferred from where to where. Um, okay, so this is a real problem. And the, real, the reason this is such a real problem is because essentially, you know, exposing these values is not acceptable in the real world. For example, if Stanford wanted to pay my salary in Bitcoins, that would mean that just looking at the blockchain, you can tell exactly what my salary is. Well, Stanford salaries are not public, so already that means right away Stanford cannot pay my salary uh, in Bitcoin. Uh, even worse, when you think of a supply chain, you know, Ford wants to buy tires from its supplier. If uh, they paid the supplier in, in Bitcoin, essentially the whole world would see how much Ford is paying for its tires. Yeah, so it's fundamentally not possible. Ford, there's no way Ford would reveal this uh, to the world. So fundamentally, there's a mismatch between what we need for uh, business transactions and what Bitcoin actually provides. This is one of the reasons why Bitcoin today is primarily used as a gold replacement. It's not actually used much for, um, well, for paying salaries or for, uh, or for supply chains because of this privacy issue. And the question is what to do. Okay, so this is a beautiful, beautiful question. So uh, I don't care about uh, hiding the payer and the payee. It's fine if everybody knows that Stanford pays my salary. Everybody knows I work at Stanford, but it's not fine if they see what my salary is. So that's what we're gonna. That's what we're gonna try and resolve. Yeah. Yeah. Question, please. Ah. Okay. That. Okay. That's a great question. Yes. 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 That's a great question. So your point is. Your, what you're asking is. Uh, you know. This is just a public key. This address is just a public key. It's not my name, right? But it turns out, and there are many, many papers on this, that um, Bitcoin is not anonymous. If you look at the blockchain, it's actually not that difficult to figure out uh, which physical identities correspond to which Bitcoin addresses. And the reason it's not that difficult is essentially you can track how the transactions, how the money flows over time. So for example, um, let's, say, you know, let's say Stanford paid my salary in Bitcoin, so they pay the salary to a particular random address, and then that random address is used to buy coffee on the Bitcoin campus. Uh, sorry, on the Stanford campus. Bitcoin. <laughs> One day we'll have a Bitcoin campus, but not yet. Yeah, so that, that money, th those Bitcoins are then used to buy coffee at the, one of the Stanford uh, cafeterias, right? All of a sudden, immediately, that tells you that the original address belonged, likely belonged to someone at Stanford. And there's actually a lot of work to show that you can pretty much de-anonymize the blockchain fairly, fairly quickly. In fact, there are startups who do this for a living. Um, there are companies that what they do is basically um, people come to them and say, tell us what you can about this address. They can analyze the blockchain and, and pretty, pretty, it'll give you a lot of information on who the addresses actually belong to in the physical world. Yeah. So this is what I mean when I say that the payer and payee are basically known, essentially known. 
What we don't want to reveal is what the values are. Yeah, and the question is how to do that. So that's a beautiful, beautiful question, and we're going to address this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but okay, so that was just a simple example. But you know, so I use my, my, bit, my address at Stanford to pay, for, to pay for coffee. So now you know, oh, it's someone at Stanford. Then I use my, my, um, uh, my ad, that address to pay for gas in a gas station. Ooh, so now they know it's someone who lives maybe around where the gas station is. Over time, you can collect more and more information, and eventually you can pretty much narrow it down to who it is. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, at some point, maybe, maybe the address is used to transfer money to a real-world bank account. Right? Once that's done, you know, now you've been de-anonymized. Because now we can tell which bank account the money was transferred to, and now we know who you are. Yeah. And so, like I said, it's, it's actually a really, really, really great question. There's this misperception that Bitcoin is anonymous. By now we know, uh, because again, lots of research, we know that it's actually not as anonymous as one would like. Uh, and it's act not that difficult to de-anonymize and, and figure out who the addresses belong to. I should say, by the way, there's another system very different system. Again, very, very clever system called Zcash. Uh, beautiful applications of cryptography. Yes, that uh, in Zcash, actually, everything is hidden. Who the payer is, who the payee is, and what the value is. Everything is completely anonymous. Uh, and again, beautiful ap ap crypto technologies that are used in Zcash. Here, I'm not going to talk about that level of anonymity, kind of perfect anonymity. Here, the only thing I want to hide is what the value is. And again, it's okay to know that Stanford pays me. They just, the world just shouldn't see how much uh, what, what the salary actually is. All right, good. So let's see how to do this. So uh, there's this wonderful idea called confidential transaction. It's due to Greg, Ma Greg Maxwell from last year. Uh, and the idea behind confidential transactions is the following. So we're going to change what's written on the blockchain. Okay, so instead of writing the actual amounts on the blockchain, okay, so you can see here the amounts are written in the, in the clear, instead of writing the amounts themselves, we're going to replace that by what's called a commitment to the value. Okay, so the amount itself is changed by you know, this crazy expression. I don't know if you can read this. Um, this crazy expression that basically uh, commits to what the amount is. So what is a commitment? A commitment is basically something that allows me to um, um, yeah, uh, essentially to, uh, uh, to uh, hide what the value is. But once I commit it to the value, I can no longer change it. Okay, so it's Hiding in the sense that the value is unknown, but it's also binding in the sense that I can no longer change it after I've written down the commitment on the blockchain. Now, the specific commitment we're going to use are what's called Pedersen commitments. And I wrote down the formula for these. So to commit to a value V, what we do is we choose some algebraic elements, G and H, not so important here. The important thing is we choose a random value R, and we commit by writing G to the power of the value times h to the power of r. This h to the power of r is a random group element that essentially hides completely what the value is. So there's no information on the blockchain to what v is, but there's a proof to show that, in fact, you can no longer change the value of v, of v once you've committed to it. Okay, so that's the idea. So we're going to write commitments on the blockchain instead of writing values in the clear. But now you should look at me funny, right? Um, yeah, so, yeah, so amounts are no longer written on the blockchain. So great, so we achieved privacy. Yeah, you can no longer tell what the value of the blockchain is, but you should look at me funny now. Yes, because there's a problem. The immediate problem comes up. Well, even worse, even worse. Yeah, even worse. Uh, so uh, the worst problem is, oh, by the way, I should say the fees are still in, in the clear. That's for a technical reason. Uh, okay, so the worst, the, the, the serious problem is that now you can no longer verify that the transaction is valid. So let's think about what does it mean to verify the transaction is valid. Well, to, to, a, a transaction is valid, is valid, of course, if the UTXO are unspent, the UTXO are fresh. So that's okay. That we can still verify that. But the sum of the inputs has to be equal to the sum of the outputs plus the fee. Right? This is kind of a fundamental equality that has to hold for every single transaction. Yes. If that's if you can't verify that, then we can't tell the, tr the transactions are are valid. Maybe the outputs are more than the inputs, in which case Bitcoin is created out of thin air and the whole system would come crashing down. Yeah, that would be no good. But we can't verify this anymore because we have commitments, not actual values. So what do we do? What do we do? Anybody has ideas? 
Reveal the sum of the... Oh, okay, yes. Okay, good, good. More generally, good. I mean, there's two steps ahead as usual. Uh, uh, more generally, yes, uh, more generally, what we're going to do is we're going to use a zero-knowledge proof that this equation holds without actually revealing what the values are. Okay, so what is the zero-knowledge proof that we need to prove? Well, we need to prove that, in fact, this, equal, this equation star, this equation actually holds. But equally importantly, there's another thing we have to prove, which people often ignore, which is that all the values I committed to are positive. Yes, if it turns out one of these values happens to be negative, then disaster happens. And actually, I'll show you an example why disaster happens in just a minute. But we also have to prove that all the values are, are positive, and not only positive, they can only be in a certain range. So Bitcoin uh, allows for um, a granularity of payments with precision of 52 bits. So we have to prove that uh, the number is a no positive number in the range 0 to 2 to the 52. It turns out the first property, this, uh, this uh, uh, summation property, is very easy to prove. Yeah, this is just using properties of these commitment scheme. Summation is quite easy to prove. Surprisingly, the, the fact that everything is positive, this is where things become inefficient. Right? This is kind of the hard part. All right, so let's, let's see. Uh, how do we do that? So I guess I have to tell you, first of all, what does it mean to prove things? I have to tell you, just in case you're not a cryptographer, I have to remind you uh, what is a non-interactive zero-knowledge proof. Essentially, um, what we would like to do is on the blockchain, we have this commitment to the value. Here you can see the value over here. And the prover, what he's going to provide us is with this proof pi. Pi is literally just you know, a string of bits. And what this string of bits does is it convinces anyone who looks at the proof, so this is publicly verifiable, anyone should be able to verify the blockchain, that first of all, the summation equality holds, and second of all, that the committed value is in the allowed, allowed range, but of course, the proof itself should leak nothing about the committed value. That's our goal. Yeah, that's what a non-interactive zero-knowledge proof is, and a proof that particularly proves that V is in a particular range uh, is what's called, uh, what's called a range proof. Range proof. The question is now, how do we implement uh, these range proofs? Well, so non-interactive zero-knowledge mechanisms is an amazingly active area of research. There's beautiful, beautiful technologies that have been developed over the years. And I just listed a few uh, here until I ran out of space on the slide. Uh, but there are more that are not here. So I apologize if your favorite technique is not on the slide. Also, I kind of ran out of space with papers. So again, I apologize if your favorite paper is not on the slide. Um, but for example, there are proofs using what's called Sigma protocols developed back in the 90s. There are proofs based on what's called quadratic span programs. These are called SNARKs that you may have heard, may have heard of. Um, there are proofs based on, on what are called PCPs due to Amit and Rafi and, and, and others. Um, uh, and also there's a new technique called Stark, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, there are proofs based on what, what's called MPC in the head, also thanks to uh, Amit and Rafi and others. Um, so very, very, very active area of research. Lots of beautiful, beautiful ideas that have been developed over the years. And so we have this whole uh, buffet of techniques to choose from. The question is, which one will give us the best range proof for the blockchain? What do we mean, what do we mean by best? So remember, this blockchain gets replicated all over the world. So our goal is to keep the blockchain as small as possible. So we'd like to build a range proof that's as short as possible. And the question is, from all these techniques, which ones give us the shortest possible proofs? With a tweak that I'll just talk about in just a minute, but it turns out, actually, Sigma protocols um, for the application they had in mind was the previously best range proof mechanism. Okay, so, oh, by the way, I forgot to say, in one way or another, all this beautiful theory that has been developed over the years, all of this is being put to use in blockchain technologies. It's really quite a remarkable success that uh, literally all these techniques, all of them are um, literally now being used to protect billions of dollars. Yeah, so work that has been developed you know, here and in other places uh, as, as um, you know, as conceptual mechanisms in cryptography now is being use, used very, very heavily to protect all these blockchains that I showed you at the beginning. Uh, okay, all of this is being put to use. It turns out the best, uh, the best range proof to use before uh, for these confidential transactions is that technique based on Sigma protocols. Um, and in fact, uh, this has been very, very, very heavily optimized because they really wanted to squish down the size as much as possible. And so for a 64-bit range proof, the size of the proof was four kilobytes. Yeah, so just so you understand, uh, every transaction output would have to have a four kilobytes 
uh, range proof to argue that the output is legitimate. Yes, remember I said before that what goes in, this, in, the, uh, in the transaction are the signatures. That's already quite large. Now we're asking people to add another four kilobytes on every transaction output. Yes, so that's going to shrink the number of possible transactions in the block quite a bit. This is quite expensive. So this is kind of unfortunate. Moreover, if you want to generate uh, T proofs, which is what you have to do in a transaction, right? Every transaction output in the block has to have a separate range proof. If you wanted to generate um, uh, T proofs, you would actually have to, uh, uh, the, the size actually grows linearly in the number of proofs you have to generate. And again, every transaction output has to have a range proof. So that's kind of fairly expensive. Yeah. So in addition, if, it's, uh, if the range is more than 64 bits, it turns out uh, the range kind of grows linear, the proof grows linearly in the size of the range. On the plus side, there's no trusted setup here. So you don't need to generate, there's no ceremony that needs to, to include, involve secrets to generate these, uh, these proofs. Yeah, so that's kind of what we want. So the no trusted setup is a critical requirement. Um, uh, but still, the best we could do was transactions that are fairly, proofs that are fairly large, four kilobytes. Well, it turns out there's a different technique called uh, zero-knowledge snark. So the beauty of zero-knowledge snarks, again, wonderful, wonderful ideas. Really, really, this is like, uh, you know, among the most beautiful ideas uh, in all of cryptography and maybe all of computer science that goes into building these proofs. Uh, the beauty of snarks is they generate really short proofs, only 188 bytes, much shorter than four kilobytes. And in fact, verification, it's not terribly cheap, but it's not too expensive either. 10 milliseconds is actually quite a long time. Because you have to generate, you have to verify lots of proofs. There are billions of transactions on the blockchain. You have to verify all those proofs. So 10 milliseconds is expensive, but it could be made to work if we wanted to. The problem with these snarks is that they do require a trusted setup. So what does it mean to have a trusted setup? Well, essentially, you have to go through sort of a, a secret ceremony that generates, you know, a relatively long string. It's an, a string in megabytes that essentially if the setup mechanism is subverted, then anyone can create false proofs, yeah? What is the damage with creating false, what does it mean that I create a false proof? What it means is that I could actually put a negative value in the transaction, but convince you that the value is positive, yeah? So I can, could fool you into thinking that a negative commitment is in fact positive. What, what's the implication of this? You know, if we have a transaction all of a sudden with negative values, just think about what happens here. So, you know, three blocks, three Bitcoins come in, Five Bitcoins come out and negative two Bitcoins come out. You realize the summation property is satisfied. As far as I know, three is equal to five plus minus two. So the summation property is satisfied. Um, but if the, if the range proof is falsified, this means that this, this transaction would be accepted, this output would be accepted. And now you can see what the problem is. Essentially, uh, whoever owns this output here, all of a sudden now owns five Bitcoins. So we created two Bitcoins out of thin air. So what in the real world, what does this mean? Two Bitcoins were created out of thin air. First of all, nobody knows that this happened because everything is hidden on the blockchain. So essentially, this is hidden inflation, right? There are more Bitcoins going for the same number of dollars, which means essentially everybody in the ecosystem just lost money because Bitcoins were created out of thin air. And in fact, nobody knows that this happens. Everything is kind of uh, done, in, and done in secret. The problem is that even the sphere of inflation is quite dangerous. So people would not want to use uh, confidential transactions if there was a sphere of this hidden inflation that nobody would know about. Yeah, so in the Bitcoin world, uh, for them, a trusted setup is like a non-starter. Uh, in other cryptocurrencies, trusted setup is fine. In fact, Zcash uh, does use trusted setup, and that, that's perfectly fine. In the world of Bitcoin, trusted setup is a non-starter. So our goal, essentially, you know, SNARKs would have been great because they're short, so short. The question is, could we do something that actually does not include a trusted setup? Okay, so let me show you uh, what we did. So our work is what's called bulletproofs. Um, so bulletproofs is a new, uh, new way to do range proofs and uh, other things. Uh, this is joint work with my student, Benedict Buens, John, uh, Jonathan Boodle, who is, at, uh, who is in London, uh, and then uh, Andrew Palestra, Peter Woolley, and Greg Maxwell, who are at uh, Blockstream and are uh, commercializing all this. And so uh, what is a bulletproof? So first of all, bulletproofs build on another beautiful paper um, that again, due to Jonathan Boodle and his collaborators, uh, also, also in London, is basically they provided a, a zero knowledge system. 
Uh, and bullet proofs actually builds on that zero knowledge system, specifically optimizing it for this case of range proofs and making it uh, more practical uh, for that, for this particular application. So let me tell you what bullet proofs gives you. So first of all, if you want to uh, do a range proofs on an n bit range, uh, the size of the proof now is only logarithmic in n. If you remember before, I told you the size of the proof is linear in n. Linear in n. So effectively, this is like an exponential improvement over what was possible before. Uh, so that's kind of surprising. And in fact, this logarithmic in n is extremely practical. There are no constants hidden here. Essentially, the size of the proof is 2 log n plus 9. That's it. Yeah, very, 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 very short proof. What's even more exciting, what's kind of um, makes this even more usable in practice is, remember before, if you wanted to do D proofs, the proof goes linear in the number of proofs. The proof size grows linearly in the number of proofs. Here, the proof size only grows logarithmic by an additive logarithm on the, uh, on the size of the proof. Yeah, so if you want to do 128 proofs, all you do is you take your original proof and add seven more group elements. That's it. Yeah, whereas before, things would blow up by a factor of 128. And we, of course, the whole point of this is to do this without trustless setup. Is that clear? So this is kind of what, uh, what, uh, what bulletproofs allow you uh, to do. And so let's just see how this works in practice. So, so here is the original, here's the, the graph. So, um, so let's see. So up here, you have the original uh, range proofs, which are, like I said, four kilobytes. Uh, so the new bulletproofs are just 672 bytes. That's all they are. Yeah, just a few bytes. So in practice, this is quite short. Uh, of course, snarks are 188 bytes. They're much, much shorter. But of course, they require trusted setup. So snarks are the shortest, but uh, not usable for this particular problem. Now, if you go to two proofs, as I said, the original mechanism grows linearly. So now it's at 8 kilobytes. It grows linearly, whereas bullet proofs only grow logarithmically. So now we're only at 736 bytes. Snarks, of course, always stay the same size. Uh, if you go to 10 proofs, uh, again, you know, the original method grows quite dramatically. Now we're at 40 kilobytes, whereas uh, bulletproofs stay at like 900 bytes and so. Yeah, so this is basically uh, what they allow you to do. And so when you need to do all these proofs in a particular block, you can kind of aggregate all of them into a very short proof that proves that the, the, the transaction is, is valid. Excellent. Uh, as I said, I made this usually two steps ahead. That's an excellent question. Before I answer that, though, let me just say that even though the, short, the proof is short, the time to verify the proof actually does grow linearly in D. So the time to verify 10 proofs actually is linear in 10. Linear in D. I don't know what linear in 10 means. Um, yes, uh, so it does grow linear in D. But in fact, again, as I said, on the blockchain, you want things to be short. Uh, and it does satisfy the succinctness requirement. OK, so good. So who can aggregate these proofs? Right. So here's a transaction. So normally, every transaction output would have to have its own proof. So we have pi 1, pi 2, pi 3. Uh, if all the inputs are for the same party, fine. That party can basically aggregate all the proofs, and we get one short proof. If the inputs are, diff are from different parties, then in fact, what we provide is a simple MPC protocol that lets um, let kind of these parties provide uh, construct an aggregate proof. And of course, they learn nothing about, uh, about the inputs. So it's not universally aggregatable. Yeah, you kind of have to aggregate it at the time that you create the proof. But at least you can very efficiently do it among different parties. Actually, it's a beautiful open question, right? Is there a universally aggregatable range proof? We don't know, without trusted setup, we, we don't know the answer to that. With trusted setup, we know how to do it using recursive snarks. Uh, without trusted setup, this is still an open problem. It's a wonderful open problem. Yeah, universally aggregatable range proofs that are short. The whole point here is to be short. OK, cool. So that's kind of where we are. By the way, you, you realize these questions, these are new questions. Yeah, aggregating range proofs, you know, in the, pa in the past, this wasn't so important. This aggregating range proof question comes up because we want to shrink all these range proofs that have to be embedded in the blockchain. So I just want to show you that these are questions being raised by blockchain quest uh, technologies. Um, like I said, new scientific discipline that has, you know, lots of scientific merit to it. OK, so like I said, we can shrink the UTXO set using this mechanism. So actually, uh, the improvements are dramatic. It goes from 160 gigabytes blockchain size before to about 17 gigabytes uh, with these bullet proofs. Uh, we have another, uh, another uh, um, mechanism that proves that exchanges are solvent. So an exchange has enough money 
to pay out all its obligations. This is a um, previous result of ours from two years ago. At that time, we were using Sigma protocols, so our proofs were fairly large, about 18 gigabytes. Using bulletproofs, the solvency proofs now drop to 62 megabytes. So this is a dramatic improvement in solvency proofs as well. Yeah? Well, there's no one to interact with. These proofs are written to the blockchain, and then everybody should be able to verify them. There's Uh, your first round, oh, 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 you, you, yeah, so look, if, if the uh, proofs are public coin, then you can always take a public coin proof and make it non-interactive using exactly what you just said. Yeah, that's called the Fiat Shamir heuristic, and in fact, we're going to use that. Uh, yeah, so in fact, all our protocols are derived from interactive protocols, but we make them non-interactive using the Fiat Shamir heuristic, which basically says the hash, you know, you, 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 you hash values to get um, uh, verifier inputs. The problem is you might have proofs that are not public coin, and those you cannot make non-interactive using Fiat Shamir. No, but those are not those those are uh, secret coin, right? So those you won't be able to, to make non-interactive using Fiat Shamir. Yeah, and you can't do two-round proofs because you know someone posts to the blockchain and then they disappear. You can't talk to them anymore. So there has to be non-interactive. It's actually absolutely critical that it be non-interactive non and universally verifiable. Yeah, that's absolutely critical. Uh, cool. All right. So, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. So, actually, I have to say that it uh, was a real, real pleasant uh, treat that, in fact, Monero just announced that they're going to start using bulletproofs. So, Monero is now used, is, is now valued at like $4 billion. So, uh, this deployment, I guess they're saying here, it comes to testnet. So, you know, bulletproofs are going to be... Um, used to protect their transactions like imminently, which is which is which is great. Uh, so let's see. So how are we doing on time? Ah, okay. So so far we just had fun. In, this was all fun and games, the stories. Now you know we got to roll up our sleeves and do some work. All right, we can't just do fun and games for the whole talk. So let's do some math. All right. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about how bulletproofs work. So we're kind of at the end of the talk, uh, but everybody, please wake up because there's a lot of math coming. Yes. So. Uh, pay attention. Uh, so let's see how they actually work. Let's see if I can do this in five minutes so to keep the, the pain to a minimum. All right. Uh, all right. So how do they actually work? So, um, well, so let's, let's fix a, our, our group that we're going to work in, and the group is going to have order Q. And let's fix a whole bunch of generators of this group. Okay, so we have G and H as a generator. I'm going to have a vector of generators. So this is a vector of size N of generators and another vector of size N of generators. Uh, now, what's public is the commitment to the value. You can see the value is u to the v times h to the r. v is the value that's committed to. And what the, ver what the prover wants to do is convince the verifier that it knows both v and r, and v happens to be in the range 0 to 2 to the n minus 1. Okay? That's, our, that's our goal. That's what we'd like to do. Simple goal. That's what's called the classic range. Well, so we're going to start using classic mechanisms. So the classic mechanism says the following. Let's take the value v, and let's write it in binary. So the n bits of v, we just write as n binary numbers. So this is a string in 0, 1 to the n. Okay, and we know that if I sum up, if I look at AI, sum of ai times 2 to the i, I get v. So far, so good. So we have this value here. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to create another vector, ar, which is basically subtract 1 from each of the entries in the previous vector, right? So this is going to be some 0 minus 1 vector, if everything is done correctly. And we're going to send to the verifier what's called a vector commitment. Okay, So a vector commitment basically says, take every generator here. Remember, G is a vector of generators. So take every generator in here and raise it to the appropriate element in the vector AL. So we're doing G1 to the AL1 times G2 to the AL2 times G3 to the AL3. Do the same thing with AR and randomize the whole thing just to hide what it is you're sending and send that vector commitment over to the verifier. So we send this A to the verifier. So now we're committed to the vectors AL and AR. What do we have to prove now? We have to prove three things to the, ver to the verifier. So what we have to prove is, first of all, that the bits are correct. So V is, in fact, equal to the sum of, the, of AI times 2 to the I. That's one thing we have to prove. 
we also have to prove that each bit is either 0 or 1. How do we prove that a bit is either 0 or 1? Well, we're going to compute x times x minus 1. If x times x minus 1 is 0, that means x is either 0 or 1. So this is kind of funny notation here. This is what's called a Hadamard product, which basically means we're looking at the component-wise product of AL and AR. Yeah, so literally, we're multiplying A0 by A0 minus 1, A1 by A1 minus 1. And that gives us a vector of size n. Yeah, so we're creating x times x minus 1 here in every component, and we want to prove that, that that's a vector of all zeros. Okay, so that's the other thing we have to prove. And the last thing we have to prove is that, in fact, the difference of these two vectors is a vector of all ones. Okay, those are the three things we have to prove. So far, so good? All right, cool. So how do we do that? Well, here. So these are the three things we have to prove. So here I wrote this as an inner product. Yeah, this is a vector of powers of 2. So if I sum up, if I take the inner product of the bits with a vector as a power of 2, I should get, a, I should get the value back. The Hadamard product should be all zeros, and the difference should be all ones. That's what we have to prove. Well, you know, so I'm not actually not going to torture you too much. It turns out uh, you can actually give a protocol for this problem. So I can convince you of these three facts um, using a protocol of, follow, of the following shape. There's a lot of algebra that goes into this, but basically the protocol looks as follows. The verifier is going to send three random numbers. And in fact, these random numbers are going to be derived by a hash of everything that came before it. So this is all non-interactive. But basically, there are these three, num three random numbers that the prover has. And what the, what the prover does is he's going to compute some value p, and he's going to compute two vectors, uh, u and v. Yeah? And he's going to send to the verifier this value p and the inner product of those two vectors. Okay? So p, the inner product of the two vectors. And he's also going to send the two vectors to the verifier. And the verifier is just going to check this, you know, that this, this funny funny property holds, and the t is, in fact, the inner product of u and v. Okay, so if you uh, think about what the proof actually is, the proof essentially consists of one group element, this inner product, and then these two vectors, u and v. And the, this is what the verifier checks. That's what the proof, the range proof will look like. So first of all, this is a valid range proof. You can prove that it's your knowledge. You can prove that it's sound, assuming discrete log and heart is hard. It's also kind of remarkable. The only assumption being used here is just hardness of discrete log. Nothing else. No funny assumptions. Uh, however, you guys should like complain. If you're paying attention, you should complain bitterly. Why should you complain bitterly? The proofs are too long. If you think about these two vectors, these are vectors of length n. So the proof here is linear in n. But I promised you a proof that's logarithmic in n. So I'm only off by an exponential factor. Yes? Not good. Not good. So the question is what to do. So again, we have p, t. Those, that's fine. Those are just two elements. That's easy. But then we have these gigantic vectors. And the only thing the verifier has to check is that, in fact, t is, in fact, the inner product of these two vectors. And p is, in fact, of the form g to the u times h to the v. That's all the verifier has to do. Well, so it turns out this task can be done more efficiently. So there's what's called the inner product argument, which is at the heart of, of these bullet proofs. And the inner product argument basically says the following. Okay, the verifier has P and T. Yeah, P and T. T is the inner product, remember? And the prover wants to convince the verifier that it has these two vectors, such that T is, in fact, the inner product of U and V, and P is G, G to the U, H to the V. Okay, that's what the prover has to do. So the easiest thing to do it, which is what we did before, is just send the two vectors. Send U and V. But that's too long. That's linear in N. Instead, there's actually a, an, uh, the inner product argument shows that, in fact, you can convince the verifier that you have such a u and v by sending only two log n elements. So it's a logarithmic size proof. And the proof is really simple. All it is is it's just a bunch of pairs, so log n pairs, which is why we get two log n elements. That's the whole proof. And then uh, the range proof will now change to sending p, t, and the inner product, and the inner product proof. Okay? That's all that goes into the uh, into the actual proof. Okay, so the question is then, how does this uh, proof, how does this um, uh, inner product argument actually works? What are these L's and R's? So let's see, how am I doing on time? Not not too well actually. So I think what I'll do is I was going to torture you a little bit more with showing you how the proof actually works, but maybe I'll skip this in the interest of time. Uh, so I'll skip over. Basically, I'll just say one thing that um, this inner product proof is an iter is an iterated proof. 
where at every step we shrink the dimension by a factor of two. So yeah, we go from proving an inner product of n dimensional vectors to proving an inner product of n over two, n over four, and so on and so forth, which is why we get log n, uh, which is why the proof is of size log n. Uh, but at the end of the day, you're actually convinced that, uh, that the inner product actually works. And the way you prove, you prove correct, uh, that this is a proof of knowledge is by constructing an extractor that does this, uh, this, does this well. Oddly, the extractor seems to need three responses to do its extraction, but so be it. I'll skip over that. All right, so when you do all that, yeah so, yeah, so there's this inner product proof and there's a range proof that goes with it. The interesting thing is when you put it all together, what the verifier actually is doing is something quite interesting. So the way verification actually works, the way you verify these range proofs, these bullet proofs, is essentially first you compute these log n values. From these log n values, you deduce uh, two vectors of size n, and then you check this multi-exponentiation. Yeah, you check that g to the u times h to the v times values in the elements in the proof, that's equal to something else that the verifier knows. Yeah, that's kind of the heart of verification. Okay, this is where the linear work is. Yeah, so computing, you remember, these are n-dimensional vectors. So computing g to the u times h to the v takes linear time. I told you, verifying a bulletproof takes linear time, even though the proof is short. It takes a while to verify it. The interesting thing is, because these generators are fixed, there's a trick we can do to speed things up, which is that if I need to verify two bulletproofs, like what happens in a block, right? I need to verify three bulletproofs in this block. I can actually verify these bulletproofs in a batch really fast. The way I do that is kind of a, this is a trick that's due to Bellari, Garay, and Robin that basically says what I can do is I can kind of raise the second equation to a random power and combine it with the first equation. So really all I have to do is check, you know, that, you know, well, this exponentiation here works, yeah? So essentially, we can verify two bulletproofs much, much, much faster than verifying each one separately. Okay, so there's a batch verification speed things up, speed things up dramatically. So maybe I'll show you one last graph uh, and tell you just uh, for the 64-bit range proofs that we need for Bitcoin. Um, the um, I don't know. This is this is was somewhat surprising that the, um, the, the the time to verify an aggregate of 16 range proofs is basically the same as the time to verify 16 regular signatures. Which basically means if transactions had 16 outputs, so you know if exchanges basically uh, combined in tra their transactions, so transactions always had 16 outputs, essentially this privacy comes in for free. Yeah, the time to verify transaction, uh, confidential transactions is the same as the time to verify regular transactions. So this was quite surprising. Um, this usually doesn't happen, yeah, usually when you add privacy mechanisms, the time usually blows up. Here, these bullets proof somehow they're so efficient to verify that in fact um, uh, verification time is the same as verifying non-confidential confidential transactions. Okay, I think this is all I'm going to uh, tell you about uh, today. So I hope I uh, convinced you that um, that uh, you know there's an exciting area being formed here. Yeah, these blockchain technologies, like I said. They raise problems in all of computer science. Here we focused on crypto, uh, and I just wanted to show you how all the fancy crypto techniques that have been developing over the last couple of years, all of those are actually now being used in these systems. And there are lots of wonderful open problems here. Yeah, so for example, can we build, uh, can we make these uh, 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 proofs post-quantum secure? That means that even if you have a quantum computer, you can't generate fake proofs. Yeah, this community is very paranoid about these things. Uh, they're always very worried that someone will be able to break their crypto and, and inflate the currency. So we'd like to have uh, systems that are post-quantum secure. We know how to do these from uh, post-quantum secure assumptions. The problem is that things get much bigger as a result. And so they become unusable. And so the challenge is, could you do something that's post-quantum secure and has the same performance as uh, bulletproof, bulletproofs? And I, I showed you that these proofs are actually a logarithmic in size but maybe log logarithm is not the right bound. Maybe we can make it constant size, which would be even more amazing. Yeah. So could we give could we give um, you know logarithmic size um, uh, you know constant size range proofs? That doesn't seem impossible. And again, wonderful open problem to work in to work on. And the beauty is, I can tell you that when you come up with solutions to these problems, actually people adopt them and use them to protect their blockchains, uh, like we saw um, 
like we saw with these bullet points. So yeah, so thank you very much. I guess I'll stop here. Uh, if you want to read more, here's a, here's a, a link to the paper. I'll stop here, and I hope that when I come and visit next time, there will be more people working on these blockchains. So thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, I guess we had lots of questions during the talk. Yeah, thank you.